sixth and final week of our early church study. If you've made it thus far, I congratulate you. <laughs> the good news is that there will be no final exam, no term paper, and for what it's worth, everybody gets an A. <laughs> you know, if you really need to see this in print, you know, please see me over at the organ council afterwards. I think I have all those little pads and yellow sticky notes, and I'll be happy to write A on it in the ancient language of your choice. Um, let's begin with a word of prayer, please. Father, we thank you. You are God of grace, you are God of love, and you call us together to be one people sanctified by you, created and being created in your image. Lord, we ask that you might continue to guide us right now as we conclude this study. Lord, enable us to, to learn and to grow an understanding that our own walk with you and with each other may be enhanced and transformed more and more to the likeness of that of Christ who has prepared his good works for us to walk in. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I call this uh, fourth century Christianity part two. Uh, last week we kind of had a real fast general overview of some of the historical elements and we're going to get a little more in depth into things like the Nicene Creed and also what happens to Christianity after, after Constantine is converted and it ultimately becomes a state religion? So, uh, just to kind of uh, remind you, um, this is a dictionary definition of a creed there, but what, what's a creed? What's it for? I believe. Okay, I, I believe. And since we have an answer for a professional Christian, you might as well go ahead and tell us where the word creed comes from. That's the word creed. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Okay. Everybody hear that? So, so it, it's, it's, from, it's from Latin, credo, and in credo is literally, I believe. Um, and that, of course, is, well, well, yeah, a statement of belief. Any other thoughts on creed? What else is creed? I mean, it's, it's obvious, I believe. Why, why do we have, why do we have creeds? Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that's, that's, that's kind of a, honestly, that's kind of a snarly way of putting it, and that obviously is the mark of someone who's been to lots of Bible studies with yours truly, putting things in ingratious and blunt ways as creeds have a way of defining who is in and who is out. Specifically, if you look at your notes, the purpose of a creed is to define who is in alignment with what we'll call orthodoxy. And the word orthodoxy has come to mean same belief, although in some ways it actually comes from same prep, same speech. But uh, orthodoxy means that, um, well, for example, uh, if, 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 if I say that I believe in Santa Claus, firmly believe in Santa Claus, and I believe in Santa Claus lives in North Pole, and I believe that he has a team of eight tiny reindeer, and he manages to circumnavigate the entire Earth in a single night. And say, Russ also believes that. And Pastor Al also believes that. Well, I mean, if we believe in the same way, for example, we all believe that Santa Claus's suit is red, and that he has assistants who are elves, and that he has somehow managed to overcome the barriers of the time-space continuum to manage to visit every child on Earth, at least the ones who believe in him, well, we have an orthodoxy. But let's say that Phyllis, who, who also believes in Santa Claus, but she feels that maybe Santa Claus might actually be more than one person. Because after all, I mean, how can we possibly get around the world? Well, all of a sudden, our belief is not orthodox. Because even though we have the same root, it's not expressed the same way. Like, Al and Russ and myself were all firmly convinced of the literalism of Santa Claus. He's just one guy. He's one guy. 
He manages to do this. We don't know how. Why? It's a miracle. But Phyllis is skeptical. She still believes in the heart of it. And that would be a what? That is a heterodoxy. It's a difference of belief. And that is kind of a matter of degrees. Because now we say, now, now, now Penny over here is sitting there, and she's saying, this is a bunch of bullardash. There's no such thing as a Santa Claus. I haven't believed in Santa Claus since my second year of college, for crying out loud. <laughs> and I know, I know that all those presents that the land of the tree are not from Santa Claus at all. That's preposterous. How can any reasonably sane person believe in thing? I know that those presents actually come from the great pumpkin. <laughs> and those of us who have an orthodox belief would probably look over to Peggy and say, that is a heresy. That's a heresy. So, so anyway, creed, creed defines what we believe, and not just in general terms, but in specific terms, as we'll see in just, in just a moment. So, the Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed, if you recall, first comes into being something called the Council of Nicaea in 325. The Nicene Creed is a response, by the way, as most creeds are. You see, in all of us in this room, he was my silly and somewhat ungainly example, if all of us in this room believe in Santa Claus the same way, we all believe that he manages to circumnavigate the globe in 25, you know, 25,000 miles in one evening. We all believe he's got the right near the elves and lives in the North Pole. And we're all convinced of each other's orthodoxy. We actually might not be agreed. It's one of those things, it goes without saying. It, it, just, it just kind of goes without saying that we, we, we don't need to talk to each other about it because we all believe the same stuff. But as soon as somebody comes up with a different idea, like Peggy, for example, with her great pumpkin, heretical belief, or Phyllis, who's teetering on the razor's edge of heresy with her multi Santa Claus belief. Perhaps there is a proto clause and a deutero clause and even a trino clause. I don't know. If you've got that and you think it's funny, you probably are the only student. So, <laughs> um, so the Nicene Creed is not specifically a response to something called the Arian controversy. And just a reminder, there's this fellow here. This is Arius. Arius, um, the test could be if anybody remembers it from last week. I'll just go ahead and tell you. And Arius, Arius was a Christian teacher, uh, probably a very uh, prolific, eloquent writer. And he, he had this idea, an idea which sounds sort of familiar to us. He had an idea that Jesus was begotten by God the Father. Sound good so far? Okay. Jesus was begotten by God the Father, except that he said, in order for Jesus to be begotten, there had to be a time, a specific temporal locus, into which Jesus was begotten. It may have been in the primordial past, but you can pinpoint it. And if that's the case, then God the Father, in a memorial time scale at least, pre-existed Jesus, and therefore they are not co-essential. In other words, of the same exact substance. In other words, the Father's up here, then there's the Son. And that kind of creates what? Now, what is that? That's a hierarchy. You've got the Father, then you've got the Son. The problem with that thought? Well, what is the problem with that thought? What's wrong with that thought? They're one and the same. So you say. So I say. Yes, yeah, so you say. And by the way, so do so most other modern Jitsari Christians because we're living in the 21st century. But back then, back then in the 4th century, in the 3rd century, they were still trying to formulate these ideas. They were still trying to figure it out. Because Looking at the risk of teetering on a razor's edge of heresy myself, if you look at the scripture, you will 
discover that there are lots of times that Jesus seems extremely subordinate to the Father. Is he not? Many times when Jesus says, you know, I'm not doing my own will, I'm doing the will of what? The what? Or who? The one who sent me. Hmm? So Jesus says that, but in other places, he very clearly says, I am the Father, or I said, they're one, right? I am in him, he is in me. So, so as early Christians began to look at this, they were puzzled. They were probably about as puzzled, I know I use this example all the time, they were about as puzzled maybe as some of my Jewish friends when I was a kid. I lived in the four, I grew up in New York City, a lot of my friends were Jewish. I was an honorary Jew, I had my own, my own yoga. I went to more, I went to more Jewish confirmations, right? You know that is, right? I went to more bar mitzvahs than I could count. Developed a real taste for Jewish food, you can see it's done body good. Um, and, and of course, you know, we do what our parents always told us not to do, which was uh, I'd talk about religion and politics, because we're all geeks, and, uh, or, or nerds if you're older than I am. And we talk about religion. It's interesting, we were friends. And again, on the edge of heresy, maybe we were friends first, and members of our respective religions second. So we talk about it without rancor, more in terms of interest. So one day, one of my Jewish friends says, so what do you guys believe in? And me in confirmation class, I go ahead and I try to explain to him the Trinity. Oh. And he, having an IQ of 167, said, oh, so you guys are, are tri deists right? You believe in three gods. No, of course not. That's heresy. Anyway, you get the idea. These early Christians were really struggling with this concept. So, so here's, our, here's our friend Arius who comes up with this idea, and he explains it so well that lots of people begin to follow. And the problem with that is that the idea, the doctrine of the Trinity, is just about nascent at this point. It's just about coming into, it's just about coming into its own. It's just about coming to the point where everybody believes, but they're the same. They're one. And the church fathers are trying to teach this. And they're working very hard at it. Because a lot of other things hang on this idea of the Trinity. And, and, and Arius' idea casts a shadow of doubt. Or just throws more questions. It gets more questions into it. <coughs> so the Nicene Creed, in many ways, or perhaps almost exclusively, is a reaction to what is seen as the Arian controversy. Now that's 325, and what you might not know, or maybe you do know, if you do, that's great, there are actually two versions of the Nicene Creed. There is this original version, this 325 version, which we'll look at in a minute, which will seem very strange to you. Then there is a second version held at the Second Ecumenical Council, or First Ecumenical Council, or so called so called Ecumenical Council, is in Nicaea. Second one is in Constantinople. That's in 381. And uh, they, 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 they refine it, shall we say. And you'll see the difference. Here's the first one. I'll read the first one because it's, it's only one familiar. And you have to say anything familiar. The first one goes like this We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible. And one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, look at all the disclaimers in it, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. And so far, our is saying, well, gee, you guys are right right? Then comes the kicker. By whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth. Oh, all of a sudden, things are getting a little bit trickier. Who for us then? And for our salvation, he came down, was incarnate, and was made man. From thence, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, and I believe the Holy Ghost. And here's the part that you will not see anywhere today. By the way, this next section is called an anathema. You know what an anathema is? Like in a room full of people who all believe in the 
right Santa Claus, the one person who says they believe in the great pumpkin, that's anathema. Well, anathema specifically means that which is stated against. Actually, it's even less definitive than that, but it's come to mean that which is stated against. Here's the last part of the original 325 IC3. But those who say there was a time when he was not, and he was not before he was made, he was made of nothing, or he is of a substance or essence, or the Son of God is created or changeable or alterable, they are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Imagine trying to say that every Sunday morning. <laughs> Well, for a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons, they decided that wasn't good enough. So the Second Ecumenical Council, Second Ecumenical Council, I mean, I can, I can give you a can, there you go, Second Ecumenical Council, I can probably bore you with two hours of a history lesson on how that came to be. But the reality is, in a nutshell, some of your, one of your junior high school teachers or a creative arts teacher, or somebody once told you, it's never a good idea to can help it to define something by what it isn't. It's never a good idea to state what you believe by telling people what you don't believe. Right? Sounds like politics today. Me, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of. You know, I mean, what, what can I tell you, Steve? What's old is what's new, and the more we do this kind of stuff, the more we're both going to realize that, and we probably both realize already. Um, See what they're doing here? They're making in negative statements the core of their religion. So here's the updated version, and this is sound a whole lot more familiar to you. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and God the Father, goes on just like you know it, who for us and for us our salvation cannot be heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary. By the way, I just have to... That's in there, because another thing they were worried about was Gnosticism. And one of the tenets of Gnosticism was... There were many tenets of Gnosticism. One was that Jesus looked like a man, you know, kind of acted like a man, but in fact was not. He was a spirit being. And the Orthodox... Christian belief came to be that Jesus was true man and also true God. Not half and half, not one that looks like the other, but both. Simultaneously. So they had to put that in there, was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man. You have no idea how much long they talk about that, that one line and made man. Because he goes on talking about Pontius Pilate, suffered, buried, third day he rose again, ascended into heaven, from thence he shall come again with glory, the judge, the quick of the dead, his kingdom will have no end. Now he talks about the Holy Ghost, the giver of life, the one who proceeds from the Father, the one who proceeds from the Father, hmm, hmm. with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who is spake by the prophets. Anybody in here miss words like that, words like spake? Um, anyway, that's kind of more or less the Nicene Creed that we have today. Um, just as long as we're talking about creeds really quickly, um, I want to talk about the, uh, yeah, there we go, the uh, Apostles' Creed. Apostles' Creed, um, there we go, Apostles' Creed. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, unlike the picture on the wall there, is not something that the Apostles got together and said, uh, maybe when they up in the upper room, eating some fish and drinking some wine. So, do, you, do you guys, what, what do you believe anyway? I, I mean, what the heck, we're starting a new religion, we've got to put it all down on paper, right? The, the Apostles' Creed most likely, most likely is a statement of faith which came to be actually after the Nicene Creed. And it's most likely a response. In other words, creeds typically come as a response. Apostles' Creed most 
likely a response to Gnosticism. And uh, you, can, you can see that by the various theological points that are, that are made there. Um, it's very simple, it's very direct. We don't get into a whole lot of Trinitarian stuff necessarily. Uh, we do talk a lot about the nature of Jesus. And, and Gnosticism tends to concern itself with the nature of Jesus. Um, one more quick thought on this business of creeds. Um, this is actually outside the scope of our time period, and it's important enough I just want to uh, point it out. Um, somewhere in the 6th century, so a couple hundred years later, um, the Latin speaking church added a clause to the creed. Um, proceeded from the Father and the Son. And the Son okay? And the reason that's important is because that is one of the huge points of division for the Eastern and Western churches. Okay? Um, now what's interesting is to hear uh, the last few popes talk about that, and they get into issues of uh, Greek translation versus Latin translation, and it's all very heavy. But certainly by the 6th century, this was becoming a controversy because the church in the West spoke Latin and this phrase, and the church in the East, who still primarily spoke Greek, did not. And, and to this day, if you speak to a, uh, an Eastern Orthodox priest or an Eastern Orthodox theologian or someone who just knows about Eastern Orthodoxy, they will tell you this is one of the huge points between East and West churches. Let me stop here and ask you any questions. Questions, comments? It's, uh, I had this book. It says, the Third Council of Toledo, Spain in 589. Mm -hmm. Added the words and the Son to assert the truth that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. Uh, yeah. The Third Council of Yeah, right, right there, right there in the middle of the sixth century. Exactly, exactly. yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting because at least in fact, with my knowledge, it kind of crept in. It, 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 it kind of crept in, specifically it crept in, in the act of translation. You know, as Christianity, as Christendom, term we'll talk about in a few moments, as Christendom is beginning to spread out further and further, away from its Greek center, it became easier to do things in Latin. You know, it's kind of hard for us to imagine, oh yeah, yeah, that's great, that's a great approval, let's speak Latin instead of Greek, wonderful. But, but in those days, Latin was really, by the time you got away from the center, Latin was still kind of, was in many ways, the language of the everyday folk, the everyday people. So, so we'll do church in Latin because that's what people speak. Is that familiar? It should. Um, and as they're translating from Greek to Latin, they sit around thinking, you know, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And by the way, just to point a thought, just to put a thought in all your heads to maybe get your own inner, inner, uh, dare I say, your own inner heretics kind of working here. Think about the power that translators have. Think about the incredible power that translators have. You, you know, the Missouri Synod has had a series of relationships with Bible translations. Now I remember going through a confirmation class and, and, and the elders of the church and my pastor telling us we all needed to get the new international version. And that didn't last but a couple of years when all of a sudden we were told we had to get the revised standard version uh, again. And now, Missouri Synod favors what? Yeah, the English Standard Version. Because translation is an art, but it can also, well, we'll assume everybody has good intentions, so we'll say unintentionally, but nonetheless, contain human artifice. I was doing a Bible study uh, Ago and um, somebody showed up that I wasn't expecting, and the individual brought a translation that I wasn't expecting, and it kind of took the whole Bible study in a different direction because the translation 
which is one I hope you'll never use, but I won't tell you because we're being tagged and who knows who's going to hear this, just took us so far afield because of what I always consider sloppy scholarship. That's all we did for the next hour was talk about and, and sort of debunk the translation. So translators have incredible power. This is something you need to know as we're talking about translating from Greek to Latin and, and beyond. Uh, thoughts or questions? Any more? No? Well, words, words have a way of changing over time. They sure do. Yes. They, 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 they sure do. Did, did, I, did I tell you this dumb story? Dumb story, okay? Very young. This was pre Fritia, way pre Tia. Um, you know, young man, probably, I don't know, early 20s. I'm in a relationship with this lady. And uh, she recognizes that I'm really into religion, she would put it. He says, well, you know, I understand, like, you admire the teachings of Jesus and all, that's cool, but there's just one thing I don't understand. There's one thing I can't stand about Jesus, she says to me. And I'm thinking, what could you not really, what could, what's there not to like? What's there not to love? Well, it's when, when, when Jesus just doesn't like children at all. They say, what? What you talking about, girl? And, uh, I realized that was the worst Gary Cole meditation ever. Um, she, she, um, she says, well, you know, when, 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 when Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me, why does Jesus want children to suffer? That's terrible. That relationship didn't last a little. Yeah. Uh, words do change their meaning. Absolutely. Steve? You know, all this goes back to when God gave us free will. At that point, human time now had to wrestle with the creation that they were put into. And as the years have gone by, getting back to the words that change over time, and how we interpret what we think we understand in our value yeah. structures to say, what's going on here? And I went through this personally, going back to your Santa Claus discussion. Okay, all right. I'm going to give you a real example, because there's Please. several people in this group right now mm -hmm. that are relating to this question. Okay. Okay. A individual by the name of Carol Huddle asked Pastor, how come we never have Bible studies on the book of Revelation? And Pastor said, that's a good question. He said, in January, he says, we're going to have one. And I'm going to devote 10 weeks to it. And I said, Pastor, I've been teaching Bible studies on Revelation for almost 30 years, and I've never been able to do it in, I mean, three weeks, he said. I said, in 10 weeks, he said, tell you what, he says, we'll do 12 weeks, we'll, we'll team teach it. That began, we went through that thing, and at the end of it, uh, an individual also sitting in this group right now came up to me and he said, Steve, I've learned more about the Bible in the last 12 weeks than I thought I'd ever know. But I don't think I'll be here when the book of Revelation says it's all over. Does the person in this room know who he was who said that statement? He's sitting right up here on the right side. <laughs> he doesn't remember. Anyway, the, the expression on his face says he does. It's probably a minute. The, the punchline was after all these years, I said, God, there's got to be some reason why the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. If I write a book, maybe you'll give me the answer. On September 11, September 11, 2001, up at Gwent, and I went to Pastor and I said, 27 years in the army, I know nothing about terrorism, didn't happen on my watch, and I know even less about Islam. I'm going to study it, I'll do a Bible study on it, I'll do it in six weeks, I don't know how I'm going to begin, let alone how I'm going to start, but I'll do it in six weeks. Okay? During the book layout, as I was trying to get the answer to why the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible, it happens, and I said, uh-oh, what's going on here? People are asking me, no, I'm working on a book about God. Where's God, Steve? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Hmm. Well, here's the punchline that gets me back to Santa Claus. Okay. All right. Who would have thought a couple of planes hitting those twin towers would have literally brought them to their knees? I mean, if that just, in your mind, as you think about in today's vocabulary, sure. you just couldn't put two and two together. Mm -hmm. It was almost as though mountains had moved. The book of Revelation says mountains will move. The book of Revelation says islands will move. The tsunami of 2004 literally moved 
islands. Neither lost the coast in that tsunami. Mm -hmm. Rivers and springs will become polluted, says Revelation. Katrina literally polluted rivers and springs. Mm -hmm. The fact was, and it hit me after all these years, the book of Revelation's predictions are taking place in our lives today. Now, why is the last book of the Bible? It is the last recycling of God's Word. When it isn't going to keep happening from the time that you're talking to here, back in even before Christianity began, into how Christianity has unfolded since, for every generation of readers of God's Word, we are interpreting what we're seeing and hearing and thinking about in terms of today's vocabulary. What does it mean to me? How do I put two and two together and make sense out of this? And that's kind of where the creed came from, I believe, over all these many years. Hmm. You, you know, you, you, ra you raised a number of a number of interesting thoughts. I'm, I'm tempted to respond to some of them, but I know we've been going down the rabbit hole then. So <laughs> uh, let, me just, let me just let that stand. See, any, any other questions I haven't answered yet? Anybody? Thank you. Well, the, the Eastern Church and the Western Church, at, the, at this particular point, at this particular point, we say the fourth century, we're beginning to see some of the splits. We're beginning to see some of the differences. And at the very end of today's session, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, from almost a political geographical perspective. Uh, but to technically, to technically answer your question, um, what happened, uh, that little piece that, 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 that Al was so gracious to kind of uh, read to us there, in the Third Ecumenical Council, okay, the, um, the addition through a, assumably through a technicality of translation, okay, adds an extra clause, not, not, to, the, not to the Apostles' Creed, but rather to the Nicene Creed. Uh, so instead of uh, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father, as an Eastern Orthodox person will tell you, the, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, as the Catholic West will tell you. And that's, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the creedal difference. It's beginning to take shape. It's traced back to that particular space and time, specifically to the Third Ecumenical Council. And I made a statement that although the Third Ecumenical Council makes it uh, official, it began to creep in already prior to that. Um, what are the implications then? The implications, uh, well, the implications have a lot to do, once again, interestingly enough, with an understanding of, 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 of the Trinity, an understanding of how God works, and an understanding of the Holy Spirit's role in, in the life of the believer. Um, you know, the, the question actually is, is, is rather valid because what I hear you say is, honestly, what does that have to do with, with anything? Um, and, and, and the truth of the matter is that, you, you know, theologians, students of church dogma, uh, you know, people who bury their noses in books and carefully resemble them are, we sometimes think we're so important. You know, as we sit there, by the way, in rather good Jewish tradition, and, and we look for refinements, and we look for better, more eloquent, more exacting ways of saying things, and the people in the pew say, yeah, that's nice. What does that have to do with me? Um, and, 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 you know, I'm going to paraphrase something that a professor once said to me. I'm going to take it out of context. But, you know, the people who are theologians want to think they're so important. Well, if, if say, in, in, in Berard County, all the theologians went on strike and all the sanitation workers went on strike on the same day, who do you suppose did this first? <laughs> Okay, so, um, we're going to move on. Uh, I think I had either a question or an answer right over here. What, what's that? No, I, I don't want to take your question. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you, you have a special uh, exception. Yes. Okay. I'm noticing that one of the, uh, to me, glaring differences between the original Nicene Creed and the 381 
by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary. Yes. And, and, and you know, of course, that that's of interest to me. So I assume that there is a reason for them to be making that clarification in the latter version. Yeah, and it's not so. And by, and by the way, hearkening back to older conversations, it's not so much the virgin part that's important in this particular case, I think, but the Mary part and the conceived part, because that addition is probably an answer to Gnosticism, which would suggest that Jesus wasn't conceived at all, which would suggest that Jesus wasn't really born in the traditional sense at all. So it, it's another response. You'll notice that it's missing. It's missing, I mean, it's not there. Not Mary, not Virgin Mary, not any kind of Mary. Right. Is there in the 325 sort of proto creed, right? Because they're concerned almost entirely with the Arian controversy, which has to do with the subordinates or uh, consubstantiation of Jesus with the Father. And by the time you get to the latter part of the fourth century, Gnosticism is really quite, uh, it's quite a whole lot of things. And Gnostic Christianity, which has some different ideas on the relationship between uh, God and man, and Jesus and his father and so forth, uh, begins to take hold. So that's probably why it was at. Just as uh, just, that's probably why the Apostles' Creed comes to be. One of the fine tunings that the Roman Church has is the Immaculate Conception. Their assumption is. If Jesus was conceived by the Virgin Mary, she had to be free of sin. Yes, that's correct. To avoid the original sin. Yes, sure. The uh, Roman, Roman Church doesn't even have a doctrine called the Immaculate Conception. Some Protestants assume that means the Immaculate Conception of Jesus. Actually, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is the Immaculate Conception of, 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 of Mary. Of course, the waggish response to that is, well, in order for Mary to be sinful, then what about and what about, and what about, and we got chickens, and we got eggs, and we got, you know, it's, yeah. But that is a sort of a, um, we'll, we'll see, if, if we were to push this course on, take every century or every period in this level of death, we would see that theology continues to refine itself right after the Reformation period, and in many circles beyond. Anybody else? Please, yeah, yeah. If you look at the back part of the hymnal, you have the creeds um, nicely uh, established there. But as you look at them, it's easy to see, see where the problem over time has come. And that's always been around our Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. About his life, his birth, his, his, uh, his person, his reading. Uh, uh, you know, the Apostles' Creed has, has two um, lines about God the Father. Mm -hmm. He's got four or five lines about the Holy Spirit. He's got twelve lines about our Lord Jesus. Yeah, and that's yeah. It's always been the defining uh, point in in, in Christianity. And, um, in, in Jesus is the you know Jesus is the defining point of the temporarily channel uh, John Donne. Jesus is also the great and central mystery of of the Christian faith. You know, peoples all over the world can conceptualize on some level a father God, or at least a creator God. You know, we can, we can, even polytheistic peoples tended to have a king of the gods, or a supreme God, a most powerful God, and maybe on some level we can conceptualize, you know, a, 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 a spirit, right? We can conceptualize a spirit, but to try to conceptualize God who is also man. Man who is also God. And then the mystical implications thereof. Phrases like begotten from eternity. Well, we create a sea of poetic words, I believe essentially to approximate something that our finite minds can grasp onto when we attempt to contemplate the infinite. I think, uh, Pastor Al, that's the reason why there's just, even within the Nicene Creed, there's so much that has to do with trying to explain, trying to put mental handles on Jesus. Actually, a real exercise might be to look at the Athanasian Creed. Yeah. Is that still in the back of our, is that still in the back of our hymnal somewhere? The Athanasian Creed probably is. 
this. Um, uh, unless somebody pulled it out or something. I can't. Uh, you know, there in. It's on page 319. Yeah, there in. You know, I remember. I remember. Um, I don't just see this ever happening here, by the way. But I remember uh, my home church where I grew up every Trinity Sunday. And you know, Trinity Sunday is the only festival church here named for a doctrine, right? Everything else is an event or a. It's the only festival named for a doctrine. Every year. We would recite the Athanasian Creed of Trinity Sunday. Always. And, uh, and, and, I, and, you know, again, being the theology geek that I was, even at a young age, I, I, I kind of thought that was, I thought that was really cool. Because I kind of was just happy to sort of intellectually swim in the, in the mystery of it all and to kind of delight in the fact that the words could approximate it. You know, I mean, what, for example, is meant by very God? I mean, now I suspect that actually means verily God, as in truly God. But in my young mind, very God was like, well, very God as opposed to not so much God. Which said an enormous amount, I think. It's a creed you almost think your way through as you say. If you're paying attention, you will. If you're not, it is mumble. Okay, I do move on. But hopefully we'll catch up with any other next questions. Um, so, uh, Constantine, uh, things change. Uh, things change when, uh, um, what am I Things change uh, during the rule of Constantine, okay? Um, prior to, prior to Constantine, Christianity suffered uh, persecution. This is kind of an early mosaic. Uh, you can figure out what's going on there. Um, the kind of popular made-for-TV movie idea that for 300 years the Christian church was, was, was underground, worshipping in catacombs, and if you ever even dared try to breathe fresh air, you'd be hauled off by a Roman soldier and, and fed to a hungry lion. That's overstating the case. During those uh, formative years of the Christian church, there were some very, very terrible persecutions. By the way, first at the hands of the Jews, who were the brothers of the Christians, so to speak, remembering that the first Christians were Jewish. Um, varying emperors, and there were many for that period, had varying levels of tolerance. At some times, Christianity rose in its prominence. At other times, it fell. Um, the, per the period immediately prior to Constantine, things really got rough. If you recall, it was a time called the Great Persecution. Okay. Fairly short period of time, but it may have been the most concentrated effort, and it's probably what we think of. You know, that's kind of where you get your lion's dens from, and you're, you know, being boiled alive, and all this kind of nasty stuff that we often think about. It's probably where those images come from. Reality was, if you were a Christian, and you were caught, you would be given an opportunity to recant your position, and to make obeisance, to Sol Invictus, the victorious sun god, who happened to be the emperor, by the way. And uh, if you did, you'd probably be spared. If you didn't, your immediate future might look something like that. Um, your property would likely be taken, become property of the state. Um, things were not going to deal well in a short period of time for Christians. Um, that was. Uh, Interestingly enough, it was repealed. That the great persecution was repealed, ironically enough, by the same man who first instigated it. Um, uh, talk about uh, government backtracking. Um, at any rate, uh, the 311, Hilarious issues of eating toleration, which granted Christians the right to practice their religion, although it didn't restore any of the property, it was taken away from Christians. Now, all of a sudden, Constantine comes on the scene, and uh, there are a lot of stories, there are a lot of stories associated with Constantine's conversion to Christianity, and, and I, I feel compelled to call these things stories because while there's most likely a shade of truth of one kind or another, the reality is that like any kind of human situation, no motivations are pure. Nothing is exact in what human beings. Um, at least that's my opinion. Um, so, the, the story is that 
Constantine, men have been exposed to Christianity by, by his mom. Now, his mom is a real person that we know existed. And we're, we're pretty well convinced as a historical figure, she was a very prominent Christian person in the day. She was a very prominent Christian, uh, had access to some wealth, was capable of doing a lot of things for the church. And by the way, she may have been the first Christian archaeologist. She made numerous pilgrimages to the Holy Land, uh, attempted to restore uh, a, a sacred sites, which you consider to be sacred sites. Um, there's a little bit of write-up on it that you can read. So it is very possible that Constantine, as a young man, learned something uh, about Christianity from his mom, an icon of Constantine and uh, St. Helena. Um, and uh, mom. Uh, Constantine, however, was 42 years old before he professed anything with uh, resembling Christian faith. I, I guess that's not bad because you know I'm I'm older now than Constantine was then by a few years, and there are still some things that my mom has told me that I'm still not buying. So you know, uh, 42 years old, finally declares himself a Christian. Um, by the way, here's a much much later uh, artist rendering of uh, Constantine's mom. Uh, Probably didn't look like that at all. Uh, wrong, wrong, wrong outfit, wrong hairstyle. Um, a whole lot, a whole lot's wrong. But um, it's a great picture. So Constantine becomes a Christian, and the typical story we hear about this, the typical story we hear about Constantine becoming a Christian, is from more or less contemporaneous sources that is an event called. Uh, Battle of Milvian Bridge. Some of you may have learned about this in a history course, just, you know, history course, history channel, historical fiction, something. And what happens is Constantine is fighting his adversary, who, by the way, also has a claim to the throne. And things are indecisive. He doesn't know if he's going to win this battle. Like everybody who goes to battle is hoping he will, of course, and his men are all hoping he will because the alternative is either coming out dead or being slept. So they're all hoping they win. Now it's the morning of the battle. Supposedly, Constantine looks up. He, he, he looks up into the sky, looks at the sun. What he sees instead, maybe superimposed on it, is a cross. And, and, and there written is. By this sign, conquer. By this sign, conquer. By the way, we read it in Latin, we changed the words, by this sign, you will conquer. Again, translation. By this sign, conquer is an imperative. Um, so, there's Constantine. Um, and he's looking up, he's looking up in the sky, he sees the cross, he sees the writing. And, um, we're told that what he immediately did was he told all of his troops, okay, you get your shields, take off the, you know, take off the imperial ensign, I want you to put something like that on it. Something called Cairo. Put that on there because that's a, that's, a, that's a Jesus symbol. I had a vision. Well, the rest is pretty well known. He wins the battle, by the way, the uh, general of the other army supposedly drowns in the water because he gets into the water wearing his armor. And uh, sinks like a stone. Um, so the battle ends. We're told that Constantine is now triumphant. He's coming back to the city. In those days, if you were a general coming back to the middle war, the first thing you're supposed to do is give thanks to the gods. That's what you're supposed to do. Uh, I mean, then it was helping with the battle, right? The story goes that Constantine ignores. All the altars that have been set up expressly for that purpose. And he goes right to the imperial palace. Right to his new digs. I'm taking over. Does not bother making obeisance to the gods at all. Um, however, he did later on say that the one who helped me win this battle, the one who gave me the strength, was the Christian God. So that's 
That's the story, although it is kind of interesting to note that when Constantine put up his own monuments, and by the way, that's big in those days. If you wanted a monument, you didn't wait when you were dead, and all the time we pulled before you, you built your own. If you wanted a big triumphal arch, which we wanted, you built it by yourself. Well, the triumphal arch of Constantine, which he ordered to be erected, has no mention of Christianity whatsoever. All kinds of religious symbols, those gods he ignored, but no mention of Christianity. Nonetheless, nonetheless, um, year after this battle, something called the uh, Edict of Milan, here it is, the Edict of Milan, or at least that's an icon representative. The Edict of Milan announced religious tolerance. Think about that, religious tolerance. Think this is an American thing? Think this is a new thing? Religious tolerance is announced in 313 A.D. Long. Anybody can practice whatever religion they want. Now that was really directed primarily at Christians because they were the kind of prevailing non-traditional Roman religion. But technically anybody can practice their religions. Um, also, by the way, uh, returned confiscated property to Christians. That was huge. And I thought it was a tip off that something big was happening. Governments just don't do that. Governments just don't like to give stuff back. You know, they might issue a holiday, they might put up a statue, they might name a street or a town after you, but historically they don't like to give things back. And then they're giving things back. It's kind of interesting. So, Constantine now has a new role in life. In addition to being emperor, he now considers himself to be the patron of Christianity, the protector of Christianity. By the way, it's interesting to know he has not yet become a Christian. But he is the, well, I, I guess I shouldn't say that. The church might have said he hasn't become a Christian because one little fact is missing in his life. And he's not that close. He, he waits. And he waits. And he waits. Until he's almost dead. He basically is baptized within a few days at the end of his life. And the reason, by the way, he gave is that, hey, uh, once I'm baptized, I don't want to sin anymore. Well, would that be true? Once I'm baptized, I'm done with sin. But hey, I am an emperor here. And sometimes when you're an emperor, you got to do what you got to do, man. And maybe I might sin. So I'm going to wait. Because once I get God's forgiveness, I don't want to listen to it. Um, anyway, that's, that's the reason he gave. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, probably. Um, so here's Constantine considering himself not only a Christian, but also in his own right a bishop. When he gathers the bishops together for the Council of Nicaea, they're all sitting around him. And he says, you know, guys, I'm a bishop too, you know. And, and, and that's how he saw himself. So he begins granting, he begins granting special privileges to the church. He exempts the clergy from certain kinds of taxes. Um, he even promotes Christians to positions within the government. So I guess the church wasn't going to say too much about the fact that he wasn't baptized. Reminds me of a horrible old joke. See you? Close your ears. Because it really is horrible. Okay? And it's old, too. So maybe you've heard it before. You know, there's a story about a, a certain church, and in the church, of course, there's a church office, and in the church office is a church secretary. And the church secretary is very busy, as church secretaries typically are. And the phone rings, as it always does in the church office. And the church secretary picks up the phone and answers politely, as church secretaries generally do. And the voice on the other end has a thick, thick Texas accent, which I will not really try to imitate. But it says something like this. Hey there, pretty lady. Is the head hog at trough round? Excuse me, sir? Says the church secretary. You know, the head hog at trough. Well, you know, head hog, big cheese, head honcho. It's like, I I'm sorry, sir. 
in this church, we simply do not refer to our pastor as the head honcho, the big cheese, and most of all, most definitely not, definitely not, as the head hog of Trump. I'm sorry, sir. At which point, the man from Texas says, well, honey, that's just too bad, because I was, I, was, I was about to write you a check for $2 million. <laughs> At which point, she says, hold on, hold on a second, sir. I'll go, I'll go see if the big oinkers are on right now. <laughs> <laughs> so my suspicion is there weren't a whole lot of people complaining, at least not publicly, that Constantine wasn't even baptized and was calling himself defender of the faith and bishop and all these other things. Um, between 324 and 330, Constantine builds this new imperial capital. You know, what was really old capital? Well, we know the fact that it was old, it was also full of pagan temples. You know, ever been to Rome? I mean, even to this day, I mean, it's just full of all kinds of pagan stuff. And Constantine decided, well, that'll never do. I want a Christian city. I want a Christian city. And what does he do? He tries to build them. And of course, he names it after himself. Constantinople. We get the first part. The oval part is from a, 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 a palace. Palace is the Greek word for city. So we call it Constantinople, city of Constantine. And um, you know, it's got no pre-existing temples. He goes ahead and he builds this. And what's interesting is um, he does what every other government does when they want to build a project: taxes the people to make it happen. So now he's taxing the Christians, of course, and they don't mind because they're getting cathedrals and basilicas and churches and all these great things. But he also taxes the people who are not Christians to build the Christian towns. Times that are changing. Well, that goes on. Constantine begins to convince people, supposedly by the way without force, convinces people, you guys got into a program, this is the new upcoming religion. This is how it's going to be. New avenues open to Christians, right to hold office, greater acceptance of the Democratic society. Things are looking pretty good. Constantine begins to enact new laws. Crucifixion. You, you, you probably know the, the crucifixion of Jesus as a civil event was not unique. Was there a method of capital punishment? This was one of them. When somebody was really annoying, you know, you killed them, you crucified them. Now, if they were only mildly annoying, but you wanted to kill them anyway, you might behead them. Why? Well, beheading is quick. You can do it privately. You don't think to expect about it. At least in theory, it's a whole lot less painful to be crucified. At least you get over it. Other things you can do, too. You can poison them. You could uh, hang them. But, uh, Crucifixion is reserved for the most annoying criminals. The ones you want to make a public spectacle of. Well, Constantine decides to do away with crucifixion because, well, Jesus was crucified, and it's that symbol of Christ that, you know, hey, we have to change this. It's impious. So he replaces crucifixion with uh, what we would think of as hanging, uh, with a rope and a gallows. Um, a lot is changing. This is kind of interesting. Sunday, March 7th, 321. The government declares that the day of the sun, uh, Sunday, the day by most estimations that Jesus rose from the dead, is going to be the day when we close down the markets, close down the government offices, everybody stay at home and relax on Sunday. That, by the way, is, at least we believe, when the Christian church went from a Jewish Sabbath, Saturday, to what we think of as a Christian Sabbath, Sunday. Now, now that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because if you ask a lot of Christian folks, hey, why do you guys worship on um, Sunday and not Saturday? After all, Saturday is a Sabbath, right? Saturday is the day that God has to do. Why do you worship on Sunday? 
the typical Christian answer, at least the answer I've always gotten, is, well, it's because out of honor for Jesus. I mean, we, uh, we want to acknowledge the day when Jesus rose from the dead. But in reality, for the first three and a half centuries of the Christian church, nobody really thought that. They were perfectly content to worship on the Jewish Sabbath. Because, hey, that's when God holds to worship. That's when God holds to make our day of rest. That's when God holds to stop our usual activities. All of a sudden, the government comes along and says, well, wait a minute now. We have to have a special day to honor Jesus' resurrection. Let's make Sunday the day of the sun, as in the day of the sun God. Let's make that day a special day. The church says, okay. 350 years of practice, and the government says do something different, and they do something different. It's kind of interesting. Um, the same year, by the way, is the uh, Nicene Creed, public laudatorial games came to an end. No more throwing people to lions or having body image to get out. Um, let's see, I want to fast forward just a little bit. Uh, so we got some works. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Edict of Thessalonica. Edict of Thessalonica issued in the 380 as one year before the Second Ecumenical Council. This is what makes Christianity the state of religion. Many people say, oh, Constantine, when he's converted, he makes Christianity the state of religion. In fact, it is the eating of Thessalonica that is what makes Christianity say religion. Um, I just read a little bit to you. Okay? It's there for you to read. Um, it is our desire, it's coming from the highest authorities of government, it's coming from the yeah, emperor. It is our desire that all the various nations which are subject to our clemency and moderation should continue to profess that religion which was delivered to the Romans by the divine apostle Peter. Um, you know, rhetorical question, but what are the Romans in Peter? Just, okay. um, As it has now been preserved by faithful tradition, and which is now professed by the pontiff Damasus, and by Peter, Bishop of Alexandria, a man of apostolic holiness, according to the apostolic teaching of the doctrine of the gospel, let us believe in the one deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in equal majesty, and in holy trinity. Just a little nice symbol there. We authorize the followers of this law to assume the title of Catholic Christians. Catholic the way means universal. Okay? Catholic means universal. Um, but as for others, since in our judgment they are foolish madmen, Imagine you can make laws like that today. I mean, imagine if you can imagine you can say that you will do this, and if you don't, you're a foolish man. In our judgment, they are foolish men. We decree that they should be branded with the ignom ignominious. Yes, that's the word ignominious name of heretics, and shall not presume to give to their conventicles the name of churches. In other words, if you don't believe the way we believe, you can't even call a building or a church. They will suffer in the first place the chastisement, the divine condemnation, and in the second, the punishment of our authority, which in accordance with the will of heaven, we shall decide to inflict. So here's the emperor saying, okay, everybody's got to believe it this way. Want to be a citizen here? You have to adopt this religion. If you don't, you're a fool and a madman, and by the way, because I say so, God is not condemned you, and in the second place, the government will get you too. And you'll suffer any punishment that I happen to feel like at the time. Okay. What time is it? 20 to 12. Okay. I'll try to move up along with it, I think. Um, and having said that, any questions? Questions, thoughts? Sort of one. Mm -hmm. In the context of where we are today, 
yes, there's no reference in this Christian church history. I guess there shouldn't be about Muslims. And they must have existed following Allah in those days. Yeah, that that won't that won't really be a, that won't really come into the picture for another couple of centuries. It will come into the picture. Uh, you know, in a huge way. Absolutely huge way, but, but not yet. Not, not, not yet. But they do exist. They do, they do exist, and most likely there are some in the outlying provinces of what's still the Roman Empire. And probably people who were tradesmen have likely met some. But at this point, if you want, if you want to live within the confines of the Roman Empire and, and, and not run into all kinds of legal difficulties, you need to become a Christian, regardless of what you were before. Yeah. The other question I have, would we presume that the Christians being hunted down by ISIS right now are Eastern versus Western? Um, probably. Probably, although they could, they could be either because they're, they're out, of part of the, out of part of the world which historically would, would be, uh, would be in Eastern Christianity, but there are influxes of, of various kinds of Catholics. Um, and as a Protestants as well. So I would imagine that uh, ISIS is an equal opportunity persecutor. Okay. Anybody else? This, this really brings up the issue of separation of church and state. You know, we, we interpret that meaning we will tolerate any religion to practice its beliefs, assuming they're not about it. Right, well, that's kind of, that's kind of, by the way, that's kind of what constantly said to me, belong. But then you go to what would God have us do with this place in time? And for the Christians, that's the focus. Hmm. Now, if something else is going on, how do you deal with that? And that's what is going on in the world today. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, it, it, I, 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 see, I see where you're coming from, and uh, I, understand, I understand what you're saying. Let me, let me finish the rest of this segment and see, see if that sheds some light on it. Maybe not the light you want, some kind of light. <clears throat> so, the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire rules the world, as far as I'm concerned. And there were a lot of parts of the world they didn't really rule, because once you get much past Persia, and even the rule of Persia, some of them, you know, questionable. Once you get past Persia, there's a whole world out there that we don't want to adopt. You know, there's a whole people who will become Muslims shortly. They're not probably that yet, but the, the precursors of that faith. But the various kinds of um, uh, what? A, a, a Middle Eastern, Near Eastern kind of religions that will eventually become amalgamated into what we think of as Islam. Fight, dread my arrest, 
by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. Now, I, I won't lie to you, I, I, I can't execute this quite well, but I only the law for now is that you just float around. The reign of Constantine establishes a precedent for the position of Christian emperor in the church. Emperors now consider themselves responsible to God, the spiritual health of their subjects, and so they have a duty to maintain what they consider orthodoxy. In other words, the emperor needs to make sure that everybody is believing the right stuff. Not only can you not be a Zoroastrian, or a Taoist, or you also better not be some kind of weird Gnostic Christian. You better not have your own version of Christianity. The transformation, by the way, of Christianity, one of the places we see that as dramatic evidence is, is, in, is in the world of architecture. And, and that makes sense. Okay? That, that makes sense. Uh, I'm reminded of churches, especially where, where, where I come from, some of the churches have 300 year histories. And some of the narthex. There'll be a, a, a picture, or it's really old, there'll only be a picture because it predates photography, somebody's line drawing, or a woodcut, or a, maybe an oil painting of the first church building. If they were really Protestant, the first meeting house. And it'll all be this little clattered thing, which looks like a shack to us. And it's in the narthex of some grand structure. What, what, what happened? They got money. They got power. What we see from prior Constantine to during and after Constantine is a transformation of Christian churches essentially being, in some cases, just houses, in other cases, being repurposed houses um, to uh, the back. That's one of the uh, earliest basilicas. It's been repointed a few times, I'm sure. But that's from the temple, by the way, the architecture. All of a sudden, they're putting up this kind of thing. Or the ground inside. Looks uh, a little different to our eyes. It's not what we think of as a typical, you know, Gothic Catholic church or that kind of thing. It's also not quite what we think of, by the way, as a typical Latin Orthodox church. So, Romanesque architecture, in the truest sense of the word. Um, but all of a sudden, Within the space of a generation, we go from the equivalent of meeting in a storefront to meeting in a stadium sized mega church. Because all of a sudden, we have power and we have money. And by the way, the church on some level is now the arbiter of power and money. Um, so, I'm going to wrap it up here. and. Uh, I've called the last section, State Controversy and Unanswerable Questions. Well, obviously the questions are answerable, but not conclusive. Um, I wrote here, success has a way of bringing its own kind of problems. Have you ever heard stories like that? You know, the work day Joe faithfully buys a lottery ticket. You know, he, he's at home. He and his wife have been married for 30 years. You know, they're getting by, just getting by. They got the, the third hand car, the seventh hand house, the you know, slightly out of date wardrobe, the TV that doesn't always work. But hey, they're getting by. But they dream about the day when the ship's going to come in. So they buy a lottery ticket every week. Sure enough, the 831st lottery ticket hits it big. Now they got a million dollars a year for life or whatever the United States. You hear the horror stories about that? Pretty soon the marriage is no more. Sometimes the money is needed no more. Legal problems. Now that money doesn't have everybody. But success in a way does have a way of creating its own problems. 
And uh, if the news of the other day is any, is any uh, thought, success often doesn't solve problems. How many of you are shocked to hear about Robert Williams? I mean, you might have thought, never mind the fact that he's rich, incredibly successful. There's a man who brought so much joy to people, so much laughter.
the exercise of power and tool in the expansion and maintenance of the Christian empire that they all Christendom. Now again, I'm just leaving that out there. It's all of you to chaw on. Uh, I'll, 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 let me just finish this up. I think I'll take all kinds of questions you probably have. Um, what we do know is that about the time this is all happening, early church, well, we would think of it as early church theologians who start off their theological careers as pacifists change their opinion. For example, Augustine originally says we cannot use violence for religious means. Jesus didn't use violence. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. All of a sudden, Augustine says, well, in certain circumstances, especially when we're dealing with heretics, especially, by the way, if the heretics are violent, we've got to fight fire with fire. We have to use violence too. As the ages, before him, really, believed that violence was justified in being out heresies, because after all, those heresies could damn all future Christians, so we better to take out a few than let everybody go to hell. 385. It's an important year. It is the first Christian to be executed, especially by the way. First Christian to be executed for heresy. Um, sounds kind of weird to our ears today. We don't think of people being executed for heresy. Actually, we think of uh, people from other religions, maybe a particular religion which will remain nameless. Executing people for wrong belief, for heteroprosic beliefs. And here it is what follows you, Judge this one. Heresies have been since Christianity began. People yelled at each other, people threw hell at each other, as in, you know, if you believe that, you go to hell. No, you're going to hell. No, you're going to hell. Then they could argue over what hell was. Or whether it existed. Nobody killed each other over it until the fourth century. Things change. Um, what else do I want to say here? Okay. Worship practice. Splendid edifice demands splendid worship service. Much of the practice of worship, much of what we hold near and dear, especially if you're a high church kind of Lutheran, or if you're a high church Anglican or a Catholic, things like processionals, incense, priestly garb, hats and sashes and stoles, all derived originally from the Roman court. Um, another argument, by the way, should we ever discuss in this format, should we ever discuss the difference between East and West? The Eastern Church will say, the Western Church, well, your liturgy is sort of okay, in as much as that there are parts of it that come out of Scripture, in as much as there are parts of it that are a representation of the divine liturgy taking place in the heavens. But a lot of what you folks in the West do, say it's in the East, really comes out of the court.
So Constantine goes ahead and says, you know what, this old Rome is too pagan. I want to build myself a new capital. Name it after myself, City of Constantine, Constantinople. That's supposed to be the new Rome. It's from that new Rome, by the way, where we get edicts like, okay, you people who believe the right thing can now call yourselves the Catholic Church. What's interesting is that when the split happens, the big split, the great schism, which is not for many hundred years yet, where it does happen, the new Rome will say the old Rome, you ain't the boss of us. We're the real Christian city. And the old Rome will say, no. No, 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 no. This is where it all began. It's kind of interesting how that turns off around. Okay, questions. Some of you will show me the video. Yeah, I mean, I know this is maybe way into the future, maybe the next course, but... I mean, the kings of the future, when you, you get when you actually have, you know, France, England, thought they were ordained by God. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, yeah. and they're, and then, and then you know, we're going to have a play of the popes and the power that they will against the kings, yeah. and the kings establishing pope. It's tightened between loyalty and religion, and stuff, as you will, you know, we go into the, you know, into that part of history, it's all top of your garden. The next, the next course, the next course I'm planning to teach here is on the Reformation era, and it will be a big span of time reading blank. And I'm looking at regret that, but the Reformation era actually is the next logical step in my mind because it talks about what Reformation on a political level is what happens when all this comes to a head, when the alliance between, when the alliance between religion. And or faith, or whatever, whatever that's like, and government finally comes to a head, that brings about the Reformation, at least the political aspects of the Reformation. Um, yeah, so, 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 yeah, it's, it's, you think this is messy? Yeah. Just, just an observation for Harry's comment before about Islam is that what we see going on here in the fourth century, there is no separation of church and state. It has become one. The church is the practice. The state is the church, yes. And where it goes. And when Mohammed decided to create Islam, that is the model that he has picked up on, and that is the model that exists in this very day and time for Islam. There is no separation of church and state. Depends on depends on what version of Islam you're talking about. There, there are a few out there, but 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 it, it would it would be the goal of so certain Islamic groups to create an Islamic state uh, theocracy, much as Constantine ultimately set in motion uh, theocracy. Sure. And the reality is that you can go ahead and you can look, if you can find good things about the Constantinian, post-Constantinian theocracy, you'll probably find the same good things about the Islamic theocracy. It's way easier, by the way, to find the bad things. It always is. If you look at the bad things about the Constantinian theocracy, the abuses, uh, the, the scandalous things, uh, the, the, the distortion of faith, the distortion of scripture, you're probably going to find the same thing or parallel to it in Islam. What you're going to find is, is people can use religion and have continued to use religion to justify almost any political means. But what you just said is leading up to the Reformation. Yeah. It has taken place in the Christian religion. Such a Reformation has not occurred yet in the Muslim religion. Well, if I'm adding, if I'm adding it up, right, it really is probably we've got another 400 years before they're going to do that. Yeah. Unfortunately, that might be true. <laughs> well, think, well, think, think about the starting date of Christianity and the fourth starting date of Islam, and you'll realize that they got it done.
gentlemen, well, thank you very much for your time and your efforts and for your patience with all of this. And let's close the word of reference. Father, we ended this uh, discussion with um, unanswerable questions. And, and, and yet we know that they're not unanswerable for you. In, in the words of Peter, only you have the words of eternal life. You are the one who possesses truth. And you are the one who imbues truth to the hearts of mankind. Lord, as we leave this place, we ask that we might take anything that we may have learned and enable us to apply it in humility and in love to our own walk of faith. Lord, guide us now as we go our separate ways. Teach us in the ways that we should walk. Enable us to be bringers of light and bearers of the good news to all whom we encounter. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay.